I am Laura Spate, Executive Director of the Policy Center. As we continue to advance the success of minority farmers, the Socially Disadvantaged Farmers and Ranchers Policy Research Center, located at Alcorn State University, is creating a series of video podcasts designed to educate minority farmers, ranchers, and agricultural professionals on agricultural policies impacting minorities and their communities. Each podcast will focus on an area of agricultural policy and its impact on minority farmers. Thank you. Hello and welcome back to Policy Center Live. We are so excited for this new edition, this new episode, Food Sovereignty and the Farm Bill. My name is Dr. Kara Woods. I am the research analyst at the Socially Disadvantaged Farmers and Ranchers Research Policy Center that's located at Alcorn State University. Um, as I said, we are talking about food sovereignty and the Farm Bill, and we have an amazing guest, Dr. Jasmine Jackson. And I am super excited to have her on the podcast. She's a dear friend of mine, but she also is so knowledgeable about food sovereignty, the Farm Bill, and how socially disadvantaged farmers can get involved. Um, so Jazz, Dr. Jackson, can you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your organization? Yes, so greetings everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Woods, for having me and thank you so much to the Policy Research Center for putting on this informative series of um, ex just interviews and webinars. So this is Dr. Jazz. Hi y'all, I'm New Orleans native. I am the um, co current co-executive director of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, but I um, quickly want to say um, I'm going by Dr. Jazz and um, know Dr. Woods um, from our time at Tuskegee University um, at the Integrative Public Policy and Development um, PhD program. So it's really exciting to be full circle and now I'm talking about what our research is. So um, yes, excited to be here. The Alliance just quickly, um, it's a coalition of black led organizations and it's aimed at developing black leadership we are supporting Black communities, organizing for Black self-determination, and building institutions for Black food sovereignty and liberation. So right on topic here. And we do all this work through organizing people, building institutions, and amplifying culture. Wonderful. So let me ask um, for our socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers, if they want to get involved with the Alliance, how can they reach out? Yeah, you can hit us up at info at blackfoodjustice.org, or you can visit our website, which is blackfoodjustice.org. Um, you can see it okay. on the same chat. So, yes. Yeah, and we'll have that for all of our listeners and watchers as well. Um, so to, to catch us up, you know, get us up on knowledge, um, I have a couple of definitions I guess I need um, so what is food sovereignty? What, you know, what is the mission of the Alliance? And then how does it correlate with food insecurity? Yeah, so I start with the food insecurity. Um, I know that the Alliance, I said, we're a coalition of black led organizations. So we're all fighting um, to end food insecurity, but we're more so fighting for food sovereignty. So I, I personally feel that food insecurity is often referred to as not having enough access to enough food, but I also know that access is not enough. So when um, we talk about um, how we can be food secure, we actually need to have food sovereignty. And I'll share a definition that the Alliance has um, of food sovereignty. And that entails a shift away from the corporate agricultural system and towards our own governance of our own food systems. And it's about our right to healthy food produced um, through ecologically sound and sustainable methods. And we have the right to define and ultimately control our food and agriculture systems. So 
So shifting from that exclusively right-based framework to one of that governance um, leads and those who work and consume are all points of the food chain and not just at the end. Um, and we have our demands um, that are led not by corporations and markets, but actually from by the people. Wow, wonderful. And so um, going back to food insecurity, uh, where is it most likely found? And like I said, with socially dis disadvantaged farmers and ranchers, um, does that correlate? And you know, how, how can we build something that eliminates something that is truly based where a lot of our people are? Yeah, so exactly what you're saying, food insecurity definitely exists where we are. Um, our socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers and where that food apartheid exists. So um, one more definition, just because I'm loving to define and sharing these. Um, some of them are given to us by Dara Cooper, our founding um, executive director. Um, but now just wanted to share this food apartheid. I feel like it really situates us and I can share more about where um, we can go into solutions for sure. So food apartheid, it entails the systemic destruction of black self-determination to control our food. And that includes the land, resource theft, and discrimination. And right now we're at a hyper saturation of destructive foods and predatory marketing and a blatantly discriminatory corporate controlled food system that results in our community suffering from some of the highest rates of heart disease and diabetes of all times. And we know that many people use the term food deserts, but definitely feeling that food apartheid is much more accurate representation of all the structural racialized inequalities that have been perpetuated um, through our current system. So with all that that's on top of us, it's not gonna be like a one person, you know, or one community solution. This is everyone um, all together. So I know that as socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers to continue doing what they're doing, but to collaborate with others. So actually creating those corporate, not, not corporate, but cooperative. So moving from that corporate based food system to a cooperative enterprise. And I, I love cooperatives as they can be all types of ways that we can exchange goods and services that are like equitable <laughs> and non-extractive. So exciting um, to just be sharing um, ways that socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers are moving in the way that um, are working more together and not just like trying to carry the community on their back alone. Right. And so at the Policy Center, we truly believe that socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers are key to eliminating, like you said, food insecurity, food apartheid, food deserts, because so many of them live in the areas where it's mostly needed. And sometimes it's just a capacity issue, but we're working hard to eliminate those barriers as well. And so what you brought up was completely true and, and on point for what we try to, you know, make sure it happens in our mission and our vision at the Policy Center. And that's including all social disadvantaged farmers and ranchers. Um, soon we'll have research on urban ag. And so a lot of cooperatives are in the rural areas, but there are some in urban areas as well. And so we're looking at that and also how social disadvantaged farmers and ranchers can um, make sure they have access to credit, capital, technology, climate spark, practices and USDA programs in order to keep all of their farm operations afloat. So thank you for that. Um, and, and going into the farm bill, um, what does, you know, nutrition and food sovereignty and food insecurity, how does that play into the farm bill? Yeah. So the farm bill is so large. Um, and it is, I feel from my research that over um, three fourths of it, so about 75% is actually um, SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. The budget is there for about five years and it's over a $400 billion budget um, overall, but about 75% of that is, is supposed to be established in policy um, for agriculture and nutrition, nutrition assistance programs. But we're like here on the heels of Farm Bill 2023 and our communities, as you know, are suffering from food insecurity now more than ever before. So this upcoming Farm Bill, it can not only be transformative, but it must be because we have to um, have now some more equitable 
um, food system. So the National Black Food and Justice Alliance has collaborated on some um, 2023 farm bill demands, which we'll be releasing at the top of the year um, and excited to hopefully, um, you know, continue to share. And these are living um, demands. So they're not static where we are just going to say this is the only things that we're asking for. So if anyone's listening and has additional demands that we should be amplifying, let us know. But just a high level, three of those are to improve opportunities for a startup and expansion of local and self-reliant food economies. It's one of our demands there. And then increasing access to food assistance for black and brown communities who face crisis of food hunger and malnutrition. And then the third demand, just the high level, I definitely couldn't go into more detail um, when we get to it, um, but investing in black food sovereignty and an emerging black food movement. So those are some of the demands from the members of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance. Yeah, I love it. And it goes right into the policy recommendations that we all are asking for, especially at the Policy Center and other organizations like yourself. Like you said, we have these recommendations that need to be put into policy, put into law. So then we are eliminating those barriers, increasing capacity and access. So, so many of our socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers aren't eliminated them, themselves, um, especially black farmers. You know, e each year we decrease each year, the acreage decreases. And so that's something that is a very high priority. Um, and so speaking of socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers and the policies that we're fighting for, um, to, to create some type of equity, how can they get involved in the food chain and help eliminate um, food uh, insecurity? Yeah, I think earlier I was just mentioning about partnering with other um, farmers and producers and even entities in their community um, to provide those gaps. So I'm really big on cooperatives and having producer cooperatives, having farmer cooperatives, having even a cooperative that shares your back office or having all of your invoices centralized or just the technical assistance. There's so many different ways. Like you can even have a land cooperative or a retail grocery store cooperative. So there's so many different ways that um, we can collaborate together to actually uh, meet some of those challenges that we're experiencing. Um, but particularly um, collaborating with that local municipality. So if you have um, a local food policy council, it may even be regional, um, attend a meeting or see what type of campaign they have going on or see how you can be involved in making not just a change in your community right now, but making something lasting that's going to outlive us all. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. And just to clarify with the alliance, do you do... Um, like one-on-one -on -one technical assistance with farmers? Because at the policy center, we can't, but I just wanted to see if you all do. Yeah, and it depends on what that technical assistance is. Right now we have, um, for our current members, a letter of inquiry out um, for some funding that we're, um, we've been <laughs> raising to regain stewardship of 15 million acres. That's our large goal. This funding will not actually, of course, equate to that, but it will be starting off. So. And it doesn't necessarily seem like, oh, it has to be to purchase land. It also can be to um, provide infrastructure. So we mentioned the barriers that we have in capacity um, that exist in our socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers. So right now we are directly um, providing assistance. Um, and that looks like awards and also support to connect with local um, organizations and others that are also doing this work. So we're not starting from scratch or reinventing the wheel. No, and it's so important, right? Because for so long, our farmers have not felt like they've been heard. They have not felt like someone has listened. They have not felt like they've been seen or had a platform. And I think that the work that you and I are doing are, is really, you know, trying to make sure that we elevate some people that felt like they have been forgotten about. And we are, are really trying to make sure that that is no longer the case. And, you know, like you said, me and you have known each other for a while now. And it is amazing that we can say that we're doing this work that we truly believe in. Um, and, you know, started started from the bottom. And, and now we're really out here trying to change goals for future generations. And so I, I really I'm just proud of us, honestly. Um, but to get back on track. <laughs> I'll just Sometimes say I know the ancestors. Say that one more time. 
I was just going to say I'm proud and I know the ancestors are proud. And so um, as everyone that's here now and those that are to come, it does get me emotional thinking about this is our life's work and how big it is. It's, it's bigger than us. This is not for We didn't get these PhDs for us. This is community work. So um, thank you for um, being you. Yeah, sometimes you got to stop and do a praise break, I promise. But um, so this is our closing question. I I thank you so much for being here. But to bring it back to policy and how policy um, affects, you know, your members, our socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers, um, the White House has released a national strategy on how to end hunger. And they just also had a conference on hunger, nutrition and health. Um, this just happened, so you might not have all the information on it, but do you have any recommendations or other demands that you would like to push that you feel that the White House, um, House Ag, you know, anyone else that is involved in the farm bill process needs to know and needs to make a priority? Yeah, thank you so much for this question. So we have a policy table at the Alliance and we have not um, debriefed on this White House conference, but um, I would like to just amplify some of the demands that we've already gathered um, that goes along with the Farm Bill, but I feel that it directly relates to this national strategy. Um, and I'm just going to start off with this reintroduction of the Justice for Black Farmers Act. So Senator Booker's staff, we are working closely with um, and are hoping to relaunch in a campaign to introduce this act and have it included in the Farm Bill. Um, there were so many key parts of the Justice for Black Farmers Act, including, um, you know, supporting our incoming generation, new generational farmers with land and resources and lots of training. So excited about that potential of the reintroduction of the Justice for Black Farmers Act. Um, and just also um, looking at that goal um, that President Biden announced saying that um, they're ending hunger and increasing healthy eating and physical activity by 2023. And their goal is so fewer Americans can experience diet related diseases um, and reducing health disparities. I, I said and think about how audacious and ambitious that goal is by 2023, which is very soon and around the corner. So I think there's going to be some drastic changes that need to be made. And the ones that they listed um, in the strategy is about improving food access and affordability. So it definitely um, details about expanding SNAP eligibility to more underserved populations. But I just want to be sure that we're taking a look right now at our current SNAP programs and all the barriers that currently exist in it and not just saying that we're going to put more access when there there's not ac full access now. So just removing some of those additional work requirements for SNAP el eligibility, specifically for college students and those who may um, be in between work. Um, that That's one of the um, demands that we've included um, for Farm Bill, but also just thinking about creating alternative methods for verification for food insecure farmers and agriculture workers to qualify for these food assistance programs. So many of our socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers are not able to feed themselves in the ways that they, we know that they should be able to, the ways that they feed our communities. So thinking about how you have to have pay stubs or W-2s or the things that are the, the barriers that exist currently for SNAP um, eligibility that are a lot of our um, food insecure farmers do not have. So just thinking about some alternative methods, um, challenging the White House to be sure that we're thinking about those and then providing some more resources and abolishing all these barriers for returning citizens and formerly incarcerated people accessing these agriculture and SNAP opportunities. So we do know that um, that is an issue and I will be on a soapbox forever if I go into it. So there are many ways that our um, returning um, brothers and sisters are not able to access if they have a drug charge, they are not eligible at all for any SNAP. So thinking about how we're reducing some of those barriers. And then back into um, our socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers, finding um, some ways to um, actually promote food buying in emerging local markets. So I know it's a little difficult to get that startup money. So right now we have like a lot of awareness because of COVID and how things have shifted our global food chain and how it's not, how very volatile it is. So thinking about ways that federal money can be sent down to municipalities to like 
hey, if you all have a, a food buying club that you want to experiment with or you are looking to build a co-op, this is seed money for that organizing because it takes eight to 12 years to build a co-op, y'all. It is not short work. So thinking about that and my last soapbox point here is easing the point of sale um, with SNAP benefits. So if we're going to increase the possibility of getting it, um, having SNAP benefits, we want to also increase the possibility of farmers participating in that process. So actually putting forth some federal policy to standardize that process to get SNAP benefits. Right now it's state to state, specifically that double bucks program. Right now you have to do so much paperwork and it has to be like available at your market. And it's really hard to be like, mm -hmm. oh, I have a farm stand and people can come to me directly and or I can drop off the food and um, do a transaction at that time. But there, it sounds like it should be easy, but it is almost impossible for our socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers to um, participate in um, some of these programs. So I could go on more about the recommendations, but I suggest and strongly advocate for that community-based and led research. I know that last point was about enhancing nutrition and food security research. We are both doctors and PhDs, but we do not feel like we're extractive in any ways um, with the research that we've always been working directly with farmers and grassroots organizations. So I do encourage that federal policy lends towards that and not necessarily leave the money in institutional hands to decide on which ways that um, research is either conducted or um, implemented as well, because it's always good to like get the research done, but then like, how does this really look in real life? So basing it on actual community needs and possible solutions. So. Thank you again for this question. Thank you so much for this platform. I am elated um, for this to be happening. And I know we got a long way to go, but we definitely can do it together. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Jazz, Dr. Jasmine Jackson with the Alliance. Um, I am so thankful, and I think this was a great episode, but I'm so thankful for you and the work that you guys are doing and how we can really make sure that all social dis disadvantaged farmers and ranchers, excuse me, know their, that their capacity can continue to grow and that there's people working in their corner. And so I think that you made some wonderful points and how we can, um, you know, engage in food and sovereignty, how we can challenge food insecurity, and how we can make sure that our socially disadvantaged farmers are involved with each step. And I think that that's um, definitely important. Um, so once again, thank you. My name is Dr. Kara Woods. I'm the research analyst at the Policy Center. Thank you so much, Dr. Jasmine Jackson. And we're going to wrap it up for this episode, but please join us for the next one.